So this ball and rod are in free fall together. But watch what happens when the left side of the rod hits the ground. The rod doesn't suddenly stop, it rotates. And in fact, the right side of the rod actually speeds up, moving down toward the ground faster than the ball, which is just in free fall. And that's counterintuitive. Why would part of the rod actually speed up when the rod hits the ground? Now, I posted this clip as a short a few days ago and promised an explanation of the physics behind what's happening. So here it is. See, the acceleration of the tip of the rod is actually the combined result of two different physical concepts. The first being torque, and the second being angular momentum. Now there's some equations that may be new to you that pop up in this solution, and I'll do my best to explain them as I go. Now starting with torque. So let's take this rod in question and set one end of the rod on a pivot point or a fulcrum, maybe something like the edge of a table. And on the other end of the rod, let's just set the ball. Now if we were to release this rod from rest, gravity is going to pull downward on the center of gravity of the rod, or really, on the middle of the rod. And I don't really care what the mass of that rod is, we're just going to say it has some mass m, meaning the force by gravity is going to be mg, or mass times the downward acceleration due to gravity. Now you may be tempted to think that gravity is going to pull this entire rod downward at the acceleration due to gravity, or 9.8 on the surface of the Earth. But the catch is, this pivot point is holding up the left side of the rod. So when we let go of the rod, the rod's going to rotate around the pivot point. And the counterintuitive part of this is that this tip of the rod is going to accelerate downward at a rate greater than g. And looking at the slow-mo video of this, you can actually see the tip of the rod accelerates downward faster than the ball, which is just in free fall, or accelerating downward at g. And let me walk you through why that is. You see, you've probably heard of Newton's second law, or F equals ma. What you may not realize is Newton's second law can be applied in a circle. Now when applied in a circle, Newton's second law says that the net torque acting on an object is equal to something called the rotational moment of inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration. In short, rotational moment of inertia is sort of like the rotational version of mass, and angular acceleration is, well, the angular or rotational version of acceleration. Now, if you want to see more about rotational moment of inertia, just click up here. It's a confusing subject, so I've done some videos on it in the past. Now, it's gravity which is producing a torque or a twisting force around this pivot point right here. And so it's that torque that's going to cause this rod, which has some inertia, to rotate. Now it's important in our calculations to actually calculate the amount of torque produced by this rod. And torque can be calculated using the equation, torque is equal to Rf sine theta. Where R is the distance from the pivot to the force, F is the force, and theta is the angle between the force and the lever. Or really the radius vector. Now in this problem, we don't actually need to know the distance between this pivot point and this force. I'll show you why. See, let's just say this lever has some length L. I don't care what that value of L is. You'll see it cancels out in a minute here. But the key idea is this force by gravity is acting in the middle of the rod, or really at a distance L over 2 from the pivot point. And this force acting at some radius is producing a torque. So plugging this force and radius into our torque equation, we now have the net torque by gravity acting on this entire rod. Now setting that equal to the rotational moment of inertia of a rod, which is given by the equation 1 3rd ml squared, multiplied by the angular acceleration, we can solve for how quickly this rod is going to rotate, or really accelerate, around this pivot point as soon as we let go of the rod. Now, I get this is a bit of a magically appearing equation. If you want to see this derived, just click up here. Now, the last step before we have ourselves a little cancel party and a solution here is dealing with this alpha, or angular acceleration. See, this tells us how rapidly, in radians per second squared, this entire rod is going to rotate around this pivot point right here.
But we're trying to solve for what's called the translational or linear acceleration of the very end of this rod. And to do that, we need one more equation. See, angular acceleration is given by a, the linear acceleration, which we're trying to solve for, divided by the radius, or the distance from a pivot point to the point we're trying to analyze the linear motion of. Again, in this case, the end of the rod. So subbing this equation in right here for alpha, and plugging in the distance from the pivot point to the tip of the rod, or L, for a radius, you see we're left with a cancel party here. So your masses go away, and so does the length of the rod. This leaves us with the equation. A, the acceleration at the tip of the rod, is equal to 3 halves g. Really all that means is when we release this rod from rest, the tip of the rod is going to accelerate downward at roughly 15 meters per second squared. As a result, what we see is the tip of the rod moving down faster than the ball, which is in free fall, accelerating downward at only 9.8 meters per second squared. Now looking at the solution using torque will account for the acceleration of the tip of this rod when this whole thing is released from rest. But to account for the fact that both the rod and ball are initially moving, we need to turn to something called angular momentum. So let's say we took the same rod and threw it horizontally so that the edge of the rod just barely clipped a fixed point, like the edge of a table. And when the tip of the rod hits the edge of the table, the rod's going to rotate around that edge of the table. And what I want to show you using angular momentum is that the tip of the rod opposite the table is actually going to be traveling faster after this collision with the table than it was before the rod collided with the table. Now the angular momentum of a rotating object is given by the equation L is equal to I omega. Where L is the angular momentum, I is that rotational moment of inertia popping up again, and omega is the angular velocity, or the rotational velocity. It's like RPMs in a car, except we measure it in radians per second. Now there's another way to look at angular momentum, and that is for a non-rotating object, given by L is equal to mvr, where L is again the angular momentum, m is the mass of the object, v is the velocity, and r is the distance between the center of mass and any reference point we choose. Now while this idea of non-rotating angular momentum may seem counterintuitive, let's actually look at this rotating rod to explain what's going on here. You see, according to this equation, which is a bit easier to wrap your head around, at this point when the rod is rotating around this corner right here, it has some rotational moment of inertia, just like we saw over here. And it's rotating with a certain angular velocity around this corner. So it's not too large of a leap to say that this rod, rotating around this corner, has some angular momentum. And so to show you that this rod which is moving horizontally, or non-rotating, must have had some angular momentum, I want to take a look at torque. You see, the only force acting on this rod as it rotates around this corner is the force between the corner and the rod itself. And that force is acting right here on the tip of the rod. Now going back to our equation for torque over here, Rf sine theta, we have a force which is acting exactly at the corner of this table, or really at a radius of zero. And ultimately what that means is that around this corner of the table right here, there is no torque. Now just like a linear force can cause a change in what we call linear momentum, a torque will cause a change in angular momentum. Now since there's no torque around this point right here, that means that whatever angular momentum this rod has after the collision with the table, it must have had over here when it was moving horizontally. We're just going to use this equation to describe that angular momentum rather than this equation. And since there's no torque around this corner right here, in this collision with the table, the angular momentum before the collision, that is when the rod's moving horizontally, is going to be equal to the angular momentum of the rod after the collision, or when it's rotating. Why did I write F there? L 
final. There we go. Now using this non-rotating equation for the initial angular momentum of this rod, the rod has some initial mass m, which isn't going to change, and initial velocity, we're going to call that v initial, or just vi, multiplied by r, that is the distance from the center of gravity of the rod to the point we care about. Now when the rod's right here, the center of gravity is of course in the middle of the rod, and the point of reference, or the point that everything's rotating around, is this corner right here. So that radius, or distance, is going to be L, the length of the rod, over 2. Now we're going to set that equal to the final angular momentum of this rod as it rotates around the corner. So again, using the rotational moment of inertia of a rod about its end, that's 1 third ml squared, multiplied by the angular velocity, omega. Now just like we saw over here, or alpha, the angular acceleration was equal to a, the linear acceleration at some point on that rotating object, over the radius. Omega, the angular velocity, is equal to the linear velocity, in this case, we care about the linear velocity of the tip of the rod over the radius. So saying v is the velocity at the tip of the rod, and the radius, that is the distance from the corner to the edge of the rod, is l. We have an expression for omega, and subbing that in right here, we have an expression relating the initial angular momentum of the rod to the final angular momentum of the rod. And realize, with a little bit of cancellation here, our masses cancel out, the L's cancel out, we're left with the initial velocity over 2 is equal to the velocity of the tip of the rod just after the collision over 3. Or to put it a different way, the final velocity of the tip of the rod is 3 halves the initial velocity of the entire rod. So if we were to throw this rod at the edge of the table at say 5 meters per second, immediately after that collision, the tip of the rod would have actually sped up to about 3 halves of that initial velocity, or 7.5 meters per second. Now going back to the very beginning, with the ball and the rod falling and hitting the floor, really all we have is a combination of the torque by gravity causing the rod to speed up faster than the ball, as well as the angular momentum of the rod causing the tip of the rod to move faster than the rod was falling downward. So I hope you found this discussion of torque and angular momentum somehow useful. And on that note, that's all for now.